Thank you very much for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, it's 9.33, so I'll finish by 10.33. I promise I won't go over time. So uh, I'm going to talk about, I'm going to define some objects uh, which are interesting in the context of a certain set of problems. Um, some of these problems uh, are, are solved uh, by means of studying these objects. And some of the problems are still open. And so hopefully I'll give you a flavor of uh, what goes on in this little corner of uh, geometric group theory. So um, the primary focus will be on groups of piecewise projective homeomorphisms. Uh, of uh, one manifolds, connected one manifolds, such as the circle or the real line or a closed interval. And um, I'll start with a question uh, which goes back to uh, the 1950s. It's called the von Neumann Day problem. Um, so it's a question that was asked by Mahlon Day in the 1950s, and he attributed the question to von Neumann. Uh, the question asks, uh, are there non-amenable groups that do not contain F2, that do not contain the free group of rank 2? And uh, so this notion of amenability was uh, defined by von Neumann in his study of the Banach-Tarski paradox. He understood that the reason behind the paradox was the non-amenability of the free group of rank 2. And he observed that, well, the free group of rank 2 is non-amenable, and that any group that contains the free group of rank 2 as a subgroup is also non-amenable. So let me give you a quick definition of non-amenability. Uh, it's not the original definition of von Neumann. It's a, a reformulation due to Tarski. And uh, this is the definition I'm about to write. Um, a group G is non amenable if there exist sets A1 through AN, B1 through BM subsets of the group that are pairwise disjoint, pairwise disjoint, and elements F1 through Fn and G1 through Gm of the group, such that the group can be expressed as a union over I of Fi times Ai, and as the union of Gj times uh, Bj. Um, so this, this is simply the, the translation of, uh, by group multiplication on the left of this set. Um, and so the classical, uh, so this is a so-called paradoxical decomposition. Uh, and the classical paradoxical decomposition that appears in the, um, in the Banach-Tarski paradox is that of the free group of rank two. So for instance, if you take the free group of rank two generated by A and B, freely generated, uh, then you take the words that, uh, the reduced words that start with A, the reduced words that start with A inverse, B, B inverse, you have these four sets. You can perform such a paradoxical decomposition. It's a very interesting exercise to do that. Um, and um, so this is the notion of, of non-amenability. The number of pieces in this is interesting. How many pieces do you need? So what is, this? So, so this is M. Um, what is the smallest number of pieces N plus M you need for a group G? This is the so-called Tarski number of the group. And uh, very little is known about Tarski numbers of groups, and that's an interesting topic in and of itself. So the question, the von Neumann day problem, was solved. The answer is yes. It was solved by Olshansky in 1979. In 1979, constructed Tarski monsters. Tarski monsters. These are finitely generated infinite torsion groups, hence they cannot contain free subgroups, and uh, Olchansky proved that they are non-amenable. 
Uh, however, these examples are not finitely presentable. They do not admit a finite presentation. And so the question was, the question that followed was, do there exist finitely presented examples? And the answer is, again, yes. And it's due to Olshansky and Sapir. from 2002, uh, 2002, they constructed torsion by cyclic monsters, torsion by cyclic, finitely presented groups. And they, uh, the way the construction is performed, they don't contain free subgroups, and they start with one of these Starsky monsters, so in the resulting group is non-amenable because amenability is inherited by subgroups, and so non-amenability is inherited by overgroups. And uh, the, the construction is quite difficult. It's 110 pages long, and uh, Sapir estimates that the number of relations in this uh, presentation is more than 10 to the power 200, which is more than the number of atoms in the universe. So it's, it's, it's a very uh, unwieldy presentation, even though the construction is a, is a great achievement. Um, so people were still hunting for uh, examples which are more down to earth. And uh, so some examples were constructed recently, and I'm, I'm going to describe uh, some of these examples. So uh, Mano, in uh, 2012, uh, 2012, constructed the following groups. For A, a subring of R. Uh, the group H of A is the group of piecewise PSL to A homeomorphisms of the real line uh, with breakpoints in the set P of A. This set P of A is the set of fixed points of hyperbolic elements of PSL to A. So recall that PSL to R acts by Mobius transformations on the real projective line, which I identify with the reals together with a point at infinity. So this action is this action by fractional linear transformations. And so you can consider piecewise PSL to R homeomorphisms. So for instance, you take the real line and uh, you chop it up into finitely many <coughs> intervals and you define a homeomorphism, the, the restriction of which to every interval in the partition is a restriction of a Mobius transformation coming from PSL to A, such that the two restrictions agree on the common point. So it's a homeomorphism. And the breakpoints are these points where you partition the real line. And they must lie in this PSL to A invariant set PA. Um, the, the theorem of Mano. Please uh, stop me to ask a question if this definition uh, is not clear. Yeah, finitely, finitely. finitely many intervals in each homeomorphism, yes. The theorem of Mano is that if A is not equal to the integers, then H of A is non-amenable uh, and does not contain a free group, does not contain F2. So these are really beautiful uh, counterexamples to the, well, which was originally stated as a conjecture that there shouldn't be any non-amenable groups without free subgroups. So th these are really beautiful examples, very concrete, easy to understand. However, they're not finitely presentable. In fact, they're not even finitely generatable. Um, and so uh, I defined, together with Justin Moore, the following uh, 
example. So I'm going to define three piecewise projective homeomorphisms of the real line. The first is simply translation by one. The second is the identity if t is less than or equal to zero. It's uh, t over one minus t if t is between zero and half. Three minus one over t if t is between half and one. And t plus one if t is at least one. And the third one is C of t is the identity outside the unit interval 0, 1. And it's 2t over 1 plus t if t is in 0, 1. And uh, define the group G0 as the group generated by A, B, and C. And we proved that G0 is non-amenable, does not contain F2, and is finitely presented with three generators and nine relations. So this was uh, an improvement from, from that. And then subsequently I proved that G0 is of type F infinity. So it's finitely presented in a very strong sense. Type F infinity means that it's a group is of type F infinity if it is the fundamental group of an aspherical CW complex um, which has uh, finitely many cells in every dimension. So it's, uh, there are uh, these so-called finiteness properties type Fn which are topological generalizations of uh, the classical finiteness properties, uh, finite generation and finite presentability. And uh, it's a very beautiful topic. And um, this is, is particularly interesting in the context of group, groups acting on the circle. Because groups acting on the circle tend to have interesting f uh, finiteness properties. And for every group that you construct, uh, it seems to be a, a sort of an independent challenge to find its, the right finiteness properties of the group. And so this is the first example, which is type F infinity, non-amenable, and does not contain free subgroups. And then later I showed that uh, G0 admits a paradoxical decomposition with 25 pieces. Uh, pieces. Uh, this paradoxical decomposition is reasonably explicit. It probably can be made even more explicit. Um, and it provides uh, an estimate for the Tarski number of, of this group. Uh, the Tarski number lies between 5 and 25. So, yes? Are those your three generators? Those are the three generators, yeah. Yeah, that's it. And uh, so, uh, regarding Tarski numbers, uh, Tarski students uh, Johnson and Decker and Johnson proved that a group has Tarski number four if and only if it contains free subgroups. A group cannot have Tarski number between one and three. And um, whenever you have a non-amenable group uh, which does not contain free subgroups, um, it's interesting to, to understand its Tarski number. And very little is known about these Tarski numbers. Um, and also I proved that the same, uh, the same holds for H of A. The same holds for H of A. So uh, groups of piecewise projective homeomorphisms have been studied before Manot. Um, there's a famous group called Thompson's Group F, which was discovered by Richard Thompson in the 1970s. 
And his uh, original definition and description of the group is, is a group of uh, piecewise linear homeomorphisms of an interval. Um, and he visited Thurston in Princeton. And Thurston, uh, the, I, I've heard people, people claim this, that Thurston immediately recognized the group and uh, gave the following equivalent definition due to Thurston. Uh, this is the group of piecewise PSL2Z homeomorphisms of the real line with breakpoints in the rationals. And Thomson's group T, again, due to Thurston, is uh, replace uh, uh, F, uh, uh, replace, sorry, replace Z by, by um, Z together with, uh, uh, oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Uh, let, me, let me just write the definition. So this is the group of uh, piecewise PSL2Z homeomorphisms uh, of the real projective line are together with the point at infinity with breakpoints in the rationals together with infinity. So basically, so F is the subgroup of T that fixes infinity. And uh, a result of uh, Gis and Sergescu shows that uh, these actions are C infinity smoothable. means that they're topologically conjugate to uh, a group action by C infinity diffeomorphisms. So there's a homeomorphism which conjugates these actions to the diff infinity of, of R and S1 respectively. Um, and so uh, when these uh, groups were, uh, were studied by Mono and then by me and Justin Moore, uh, this question was raised by Gis and Navas. Are these groups C infinity smoothable? These new examples. And uh, we proved the following with Christian Bonatti and Michele Triestino. Fortunately, Christian is not here. H of A is not C, C uh, one smoothable even. For any subring. And second, if A contains non-trivial units, So units other than plus minus one. Then H of A does not admit any C1 action on the real line. Does not admit a C1 action. On the real line. And thirdly, this, the same as two for G naught the same 
as two for G naught. So, um, so this settles this question. Uh, so I, I, uh, I would like to stress on the fact that this group T is, is a very interesting group. So this was the first example of a finitely presented infinite simple group. And uh, uh, so there are several examples now of finitely presented infinite simple groups, uh, groups that act naturally on the, on the circle or on the Cantor set. And I construct. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I, I, I'll, 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 I'll just write it. Faithful C1 action, yes. That's different from being not C1 smoothable. Yes, yes. So what's C1 smoothable is a, is a stronger requirement. It requires that you, you admit such an action, but in fact, uh, that action is topologically conjugate to the given action. So C1 smoothability is a condition on the action. And whether the, uh, a group admits a C1 action is, is, a, is a requirement on the group. So if, if you give me an abstract group, does it admit a C1 action? And if you give me an action by homeomorphisms, is it topologically conjugate to a C1 action? So these are two different but related questions. Thanks. Yeah. And when was this discovered, the first example? Uh, uh, this uh, in the 19, early 1970s by Thompson, Richard Thompson. No. So, oh, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> OK, I think, I think everybody has read it, so I can, I can move on. Yeah. So, so I, I played a little bit with the Thomson's group T and the smoothability aspect. And I wrote down this homeomorphism. Uh, this is the identity if T is not in 0, 2. It's 2T over 1 plus T if T is in 0, 1. It's uh, 2 over 3 minus t if t is in 1, 2. And I define a group uh, S as generated by t together with this little s. And my theorem is that S is finitely presented, simple, and does not admit a non-trivial C1 action on any one manifold. So this is an interesting contrast to Thompson's group T. There's another question about group actions on one manifolds, which is whether there is a property T group that acts uh, by homeomorphisms or by uh, C1 diffeomorphisms even on, on the circle or the real line. So question. An infinite property T group that admits a faithful action by homeomorphisms on R or the circle. Now these groups uh, are not, they, they don't have T because they all have infinite abelianization. 
Uh, however, you can consider groups uh, that act on the circle, for instance, this one. So the ones that fix infinity uh, have infinite abelianization, but for instance, this is simple. And you can construct cousins of this. Uh, you, you, can, you can consider con cousins of this example. And you can even consider examples of <coughs> groups of piecewise projective homeomorphisms acting on the circle with infinitely many breakpoints. So all the examples I've defined so far, every element has only finitely many breakpoints. But you can also consider actions with infinitely many breakpoints. And we call these uh, countably singular piecewise projective homeomorphisms. So they're uh, um, uh, outside a, a countable closed set in the circle. They are of the desired regularity, which is C infinity. So uh, the, the question of, uh, I guess, Navas uh, has written about this question, and he asked me this question. Uh, what about these examples? What about about uh, the piecewise projective groups that act on the circle? And we were able to. We were able to partially resolve this question. So the theorem of uh, myself together with Mate Bon and Triestino If G acts by uh, piecewise projective homeomorphisms with finitely many breakpoints on the circle, uh, then if G has T, it is finite. And for the countably singular case, we were able to show the following. If G admits a faithful action, full action by countably singular, piecewise projective, or even C2. Uh, so you can choose any C2. Uh, yes? What is property T? Ah, right. So this is Kajdan's property T. So this, this, uh, so this has many equivalent formulations. One of them is a fixed point property for actions on Hilbert spaces, affine isometric actions on Hilbert spaces. Every such action has a fixed point. And uh, it's... Uh, it's sort of uh, 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 very uh, much an opposite property compared to amenability. The only groups that are both amenable and have property T are finite. And uh, um, really, the, the, the property that we are using in these theorems is not property T. It's a consequence of property T, which is called property FW. And uh, the, that property emerges naturally in, in the setting. We consider actions of these groups on the groupoid of germs. And uh, if a group has property T, then it has FW. And uh, I mean, if, if I have time, maybe I'll talk a little bit about FW and how we, we do this. Um, but really, in this context, the right property is actually the consequence of property T, which is property FW. Yeah. FW. FW, yeah. It's a property of, uh, concerning group actions on sets. It's very down to earth. It says that whenever you, whenever you have a group action on a set, uh, there's a notion of a commensurate set, and there's a notion of a transfixed set. Uh, and it says that every commensurate set, for every action on a set, every commensurate set is transfixed. So I can, I can state it at some point, yeah. So, singular diffeomorphisms on S1. Then if G has property T, 
uh, the action has a finite orbit. The action has a finite orbit. So what that does is it reduces the, the, the study of this action on a compact manifold to a non-compact manifold. And, and in that setting, we do not know how to solve this question. And actually, this argument is, is quite uh, robust. So it works in, in more generality. So theorem, and again, the same people as here. Um, let G be and C2 diffeomorphisms. In fact, we, we can even get away with C1 uh, and a half. B and a periodic action. A periodic action um, by countably singular. CR diffeomorphisms on a closed manifold M if G has T then the action is conjugate to an action by CR diffeomorphisms to an action by CR diffeomorphisms. So this is a smoothing criterion. Um, so again, countably singular here me, for a man general manifold means the same thing. You, outside a countable closed set, uh, you are of the desired regularity. Um, and uh, Uh, no, R is just any real between one and infinity. Yeah. And if you if you um, if you consider the recent result of uh, Brown, uh, Fisher, and Hurtado uh, uh, concerning Zimmer's conjecture, the partially resolved Zimmer's conjecture, um, if you have a high rank lattice acting on a lower dimensional manifold uh, by C two diffeomorphisms, then well, this cannot happen. I mean, this this this, this is. Uh, it's impossible to have such an action, and this statement generalizes that to actions by countably singular uh, C2 diffeomorphisms. Because whenever you have a property T group acting by countably singular CR diffeomorphisms, and the action is aperiodic, then you uh, then it's topologically conjugate to an honest to God CR diffeo action, and that you can apply the the statement and obtain the contradiction. So this is. There's some progress on this question of Navas. However, uh, there are examples, and I'm going to tell you some more examples, um, where we still do not know if they have property T. And they could be actually interesting candidates to consider for property T. But they're actually interesting for some completely different reason. I hope I'm not erasing what I just wrote. <laughs> Yeah, it's not going to be diffeomorphic, but it's going to be homeomorphic. So there's some moving around of charts that has to, has to happen in this. Yeah. Right. So if you have an aperiodic la uh, action of your favorite higher rank lattice on a lower dimensional manifold by countably singular CR diffeomorphisms, then by this result, the action is topologically conjugate to a faithful action by CR diffeomorphisms. And if R is at least two, then you obtain a contradiction because uh, Brown, Fisher, and Hurtado prove that this is impossible. Yeah. So slightly tangential, but very much related, is this question. So it's a question that goes back to 1980, 
and is due to Ramtulla. Do there exist? Finitely generated, simple groups of homeomorphisms of homeomorphisms of the real line. So equivalently, do there exist? finitely generated, uh, so I should say infinite here because uh, Z mod 2Z is, is an example. <laughs> but that, besides Z mod 2Z, there's no finite group that acts on the real line faithfully. So do there exist finitely generated simple left orderable groups? If you uh, like to study group actions on the real line, then you know that being left orderable is equivalent to admitting a faithful action by orientation preserving homeomorphisms on the real line. Uh, a group is left orderable if it admits a total order which is invariant under left multiplication. And uh, this, so there are lots of examples of simple groups of homeomorphisms of the real line which are not finitely generatable. For instance, uh, uh, various uh, commutator subgroups of, of groups of piecewise linear and piecewise projective homeomorphisms. And uh, with uh, Kim and Coberta, we studied these chain groups uh, of homeomorphisms of the real line. And we proved that um, whenever the chain group acts uh, minimally on its, uh, support, on its open support, then the commutator subgroup is simple. And a, a corollary of this is that there are continuum many isomorphism types of countable simple groups acting on the real line faithfully. However, none of these examples are finitely generatable. And the real trouble is that there's a lack of uh, method of tool to prove simplicity for a finitely generated group of homeomorphisms of the real line. And there, there was basically no candidate until, until now, uh, uh, until last week. I mean, we posted a paper with James Hyde Last week, we solved this problem. Uh, let's see. Hide. Um, there exist a continuum many um, isomorphism types. finitely generated simple groups of homeomorphisms of the real line. Um, in fact, our construction is, is really explicit. We produce a machine that takes an input and pops out an output in explicit group action. Uh, I'm not, I, I can't, I don't think I can give you all the details, but let me try to give you an idea of uh, how this, this goes. Quick remark. These are uh, groups of countably singular piecewise projective homeomorphisms of the real line. So groups of piecewise projective homeomorphisms of the real line, where you allow infinitely many breakpoints. In fact, every element in this group has infinitely many breakpoints. 
And so without, let me, let me try to give you an idea. I don't know if I'll be able to uh, present the construction. There's not enough time. But uh, we start with a map, rho, from the half integers to the set a, b, a inverse, b inverse. So this is a set of symbols. And uh, we call such a, such a, uh, a map uh, quasi-periodic, uh, uh, quasi, how do you spell quasi, Q-U-A, yeah, that's yes, I <laughs> periodic. If uh, we require that the integers are mapped to uh, the set A and A inverse, um, the translation by half of the integers are mapped to B and B inverse. And uh, for every, so we treat the image of this, or, or the, the, the evaluation of this on the half integers as, an, as a bi-infinite word uh, labeled with, the, with half z. And whenever you have a finite subword, then its inverse appears somewhere in the bi-infinite word. And whenever you have a, a, a finite subword, then for every finite subword, there is an n, a natural number n such that whenever you have a, a block, uh, just a subword of length at least n, then that contains your starting subword as a subword. So this is sort of quasi-periodic. And uh, the second input is, is a real alpha in 0, 1 minus the dyadics. And for, for every pair of these, this datum, you have an explicit group action 0 alpha uh, this is a subgroup of the group of orientation preserving homeomorphisms of the real line. And what the labeling does, so this group is generated by, um, um, well, so it's probably two generated, but it's uh, the, the smallest generating set that, I mean, the generating set we describe in our construction uh, has uh, a total of eight uh, generators. And uh, all of these, so these generators are, are separated into two uh, subsets. And uh, for one of the two, two subsets, the labeling on the integers determines how the generator acts locally around that integer. And for the other subset, the labeling determines, the labeling on half plus z determines how any generator from that set acts locally on uh, on a neighborhood of, on a unit ball around uh, that half integer. And uh, so this is a very explicit uh, group action. And the, the, the atoms of this uh, uh, consist, uh, come from the group of piecewise linear, the orientation preserving piecewise linear homeomorphisms of 0, 1. This is a very beautiful group. And it's been studied uh, a lot in the 1980s, uh, in particular by Matt Brin and, and his students. And uh, this, uh, we use uh, subgroups of this group, and we use them to build these uh, zero alphas. And uh, we, I mean, by, by definition, they are finitely generated. Um, and we prove that they are simple. So, and these groups um, are candidates for property T groups uh, acting on the real line. Because, well, I, I have no idea how to prove or disprove property T for these groups. Uh, at least the, the methods I know for disproving property T uh, fail for these examples. And so it just makes me curious whether they can have property T. And um, perhaps uh, one can use some computer programming like what was recently done by Ozawa and uh, Novak and, and a third person. Um, and and you and and, sh and say something about uh, whether these groups have property T. So, um, so if I start describing the construction, I think I'm going to go over time by at least 15 minutes. I'm tempted to do that, <laughs> but I'm not going to do it. <laughs> Um, but I'm happy to tell you the construction uh, uh, privately if, uh, if you want to hear about it. Um, and uh, 
Um, I'll also say that these groups, they all contain uh, um, free subgroups. There's a very simple ping pong argument that you can, you can clearly see. Why don't see you go and a little bit into the Sorry? Why don't you go a little bit into the reconstruction as far as you can? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, am I, am I going to be sent to jail <laughs> for doing that? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Because I, I'm, I'm, I'm going to go over time if I, I mean, okay, I'll, I'll try, I'll, 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 I don't even know how to summarize, summarize it. Yeah. So, uh, so we start with, um, um, there's a subgroup H alpha of PL plus zero one. Uh, to, to define H alpha, I'm going to have to define Thomson's group F, uh, not in the way that Thurston defined, but in the way that Thompson originally defined, this is the group of piecewise linear orientation preserving, piecewise linear homeomorphisms of the unit integral uh, with breakpoints in the dyadic rationals. Uh, such that the slopes, wherever they exist, are powers of two. So what we're going to do is we're going to define a subgroup H of F, which consi consists precisely of the elements of F, uh, for which the, the germs at 0 and 1 have uh, the same derivative. And so this is a nice subgroup of F. It's finitely generated. And if, uh, given any alpha outside the dyadics in 0, 1, it's uh, that the, the explicitly construct an element which is uh, supported on the on some interval on some compact sub interval of the open interval 0 1 so for instance we chose 1 over 4 comma 3 over 4 such that the derivative at uh, 1 over 4 uh, of this homeomorphism is uh, is alpha or if you like to do the alpha and uh, uh, the the group h alpha is generated by h together with this homeomorphism and so these are four generated groups. And it's not too hard to show that they're, they contain uncountably many isomorphism types. Um, and we use these groups as building blocks to construct G rho alpha. And so let me, actually, maybe I can do this. Maybe I can give you a, a very quick construction. without writing any notation. So let this be an integer. Let's call it, uh, call it x or n, say n. Um, if rho of n is a, then on the neighborhood, uh, n minus half and n plus half on this interval, uh, the generator of the generator which is associated to one of the generators of H acts exactly like it, it acts on the unit interval, except that the unit interval is translated to this interval. So it acts exactly like that. And if rho of n is A inverse, then that generator of H alpha acts like it's flipped. So it's, it's conjugate, uh, it's the, the, the way it acts is, is, uh, uh, is conjugate under uh, the unique orientation reversing isometry of this interval. Um, so it's the mirror image. And uh, the similar thing happens for the other uh, four generators, which are also associated to the four generators of this one, uh, around the half integers, I mean the, the, the the integer is translated by half. So whenever you have uh, a point n plus half, you look at 
n and n plus 1. And the, the respective generator acts like the generator of h if uh, rho of, of n plus half is b. And it acts like that generator of h flipped if rho of n plus half is b inverse. Okay. And so you might ask, well, what if I take the trivial labeling? What if I uh, map every integer to a and every uh, half plus z uh, element to b? Then, well, this group is not simple. But this is actually a nice group. It's, it's the lift of Thomson's group T. Uh, so Th Thomson's group T acts on the circle, not on the real line. It contains torsion. It cannot act on the real line. Uh, but if you lift the group to homeo plus r, then this is exactly that group. And this group is perfect, because it, it, it admits a quotient onto, um, onto Thomson's group T, which is simple, and the abelianization is hence trivial. And so this is interesting. So this group is perfect, and it, it contains a center, which consists of integer translations. And the challenge is, how do you kill that center? And how do you, well, OK, even if you kill that center, then why should that be simple? So that's where the definition of quasi-periodic comes in. That's where uh, you, you flip various things at various points to avoid. So basically, one property that will hold for every element of this group is that it will fix a point on the real line. Every element in, the, in this uh, zero alpha will fix a point on the real line if rho is quasi-periodic. And uh, that's, that plays a crucial role in the proof of simplicity. And so, so actually, I managed to <laughs> give you some idea of, uh, do you have any questions uh, about this? I mean, did I, was, was this definition OK? It's literally, it's actually very simple. You, you look at this, these neighborhoods of these points, and you act exactly like you act in H alpha, except that you flip the action if the image of rho n is, uh, is uh, the inverse letter. And so it's, uh, it's really sort of combinatorial. And um, uh, there, 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 there are a few obstructions to this question. For instance, uh, uh, the, thir thir the Thurston stability theorem says that if a group acts by C1 diffeomorphisms on uh, a closed interval or a left closed right open interval, then it's locally indicable. So this group action, when you complete it to uh, closed minus infinity plus infinity, then that should not be topologically conjugate to a C1 action. Otherwise, you are locally indicable. In fact, most of these groups tend to be locally indicable. Because there's this uh, germ homomorphism. Uh, so if you look at the group of germs at, at plus and minus infinity, then generally that homomorphism is non-trivial. Uh, but for these groups, because of this quasi-periodicity, uh, that homomorphism is actually an isomorphism. And uh, so, um, and these groups are not biorderable because it's a it's a, an old result that. Uh, simple biorderable groups, they do exist. Simple bi biorderable groups cannot be finitely generatable. And so, uh, by result of Dave Vitti Morris, uh, amenable left orderable groups are locally indicable. So, every finitely generated subgroup admits a homomorphism onto Z. So, in particular, they cannot be simple if they're finitely generated. And uh, so, this, these groups are not amenable, but then you can see that directly by uh, constructing free subgroups inside. And actually, if you can find uh, a group which is finitely generated simple, acting on the real line, uh, which does not contain free subgroups, then that would be very interesting. Uh, in fact, Navas raised this as a question in his ICM article, not exactly in this way, but an equivalent formulation of it, which is, uh, if I remember correctly, maybe Christobal can correct me if I'm wrong, but does there exist uh, um, a left orderable uh, group which is uh, not locally indicable and does not contain free subgroups. I think this is the question, right? I mean, in, in, this is one of the questions in his, in his ICM article. Huh? Yeah. yeah. So, if, for instance, if you, can con if you can find such a construction of finitely generated simple left orderable groups that do not contain free subgroups, then that you answer that question. But that's, that's not true of these groups. They do contain free subgroups. Um, Interestingly, these groups, uh, not all of them, but some of them, are C1 smoothable, in fact, C infinity smoothable on the real line. So by Jason Sergescu, you can, uh, you can prove that uh, these groups are, well, 
the, the most basic one, the one where you your age of where your alpha is actually you don't you don't use that additional generator. You just use uh, this age. Um, that group is topologically conjugate to that group action is topologically conjugate to an action by C infinity diffeomorphisms. However, thanks to Thurston's stability theorem, uh, the extension of that action on the the closed uh, uh, the, the, the comp compactification of the real line is, is not. Uh, topologically conjugate to an action by C1 if you want. So there's some interesting subtleties around these groups. And uh, uh, we are trying to prove that, well, I shouldn't tell you what we're trying to prove, otherwise you'll prove it. <laughs> but I, I don't know, it's still nice to share, uh, share things. And we are trying to prove that uh, finitely presented simple groups cannot act on the real line. We believe that should be true, but we don't have a proof. So that. Any more questions? Yeah, you. say you periodic, It's no, it cannot be periodic. Yeah, 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 yeah. Otherwise, it would have a quotient onto something that's. That's literally, I mean, that's, that has only finitely many breakpoints, and that would b be locally indicable, so it cannot be periodic. Yeah. More questions or comments? Was it the same as the Not closed interval. Exactly, exactly, exactly. Right, so if you, if you start with, instead of H alpha, if you just start with the H, the original H without introducing that new element, and you construct the group, uh, then that, that is just built out of. Uh, copies of Thomson's group F, right? And and we know that F is C infinity smoothable thanks to G. Sergescu. So so on the real line, it's C infinity smoothable, but not on the closed uh, the comp compactification of the real line. Yeah.